we have uh, Steve Pope, who's going to talk about public opinion polls and the referendum. And is this yours here, Steve? Yes. Over to you. Hi. Oh, um, okay, thank you very much. I'll maybe start just by introducing myself. Um, my name is Stephen Wall. I'm the Managing Director of Ipsos Mori's office in Edinburgh. We work, uh, I mean Ipsos Mori is an independent research company. Uh, we work mainly in Scotland, mainly on projects for the Scottish Government uh, doing social research. Our uh, referendum polling was largely well conducted for Scottish television in the last stages, early on I think in 2012, 2013 we, we did work for the Times. But in the latter stages, we worked for Scottish Television. Professionally, I'm mainly interested in survey design uh, and in research methods. So that's going to be reflected a lot in what I talk about because what I'm going to look at is one particular aspect of polling around the referendum. Um, I'm going to talk about the accuracy of the polling, the extent to which the work that was done across a wide range of companies accurately represented what Scottish uh, people thought at the time, and then look at what the implications of that may be for um, what, what influence it had on the campaigns and what maybe the lasting impact of that has been. There's little doubt, I think, that polling played a key role in the referendum. Um, there were about 100 public polls conducted between January 2012 uh, and September 2014. Then those involved about, that was about three or four polls every month. <coughs> Leading up to the, the referendum in its latter stages, there was about six or seven polls done every month. Uh, about 100,000 respondents across Scotland involved in total over the whole campaign. And that's just the public polling. Behind the scenes in both campaigns, there was private polling being done as well. Um, but we know very little about that. I think the most obvious sign of the influence of the polling, and probably what I fear is its lasting legacy, uh, kicked off on Saturday the 6th of September uh, at 4.16pm when Rupert Murdoch tweeted this. And what he was referring to uh, was a poll that YouGov would publish that day and which would lead in turn either to some delight, some despair, and some desperation uh, as people took the result and ran with it and started to, to, to follow its implications. I'll come back to the bow and uh, the narrative that's built up around that. And I have no doubt that YouGov were accurately reporting what the poll had found. Um, but I think we have to concede that it was wrong. The, the, the yes hadn't actually polled. I mean, the level of support in the country as a whole wasn't 51% for yes. Uh, the very next poll, five days later, on the 11th of September, published by YouGov, found that the support for yes had slipped back, 46% in that one. And having said that, I, mean, I don't want to just pick on YouGov. I think what I'm going to try and say is that if we look back over the whole of the referendum, that it could hardly be seen as the high point for the industry as a whole. Just to take one example, in September, the September the, the, the referendum took place, every poll that was taken that month, including the final polls of all the research companies, showed yes support at something higher than the 45% that was recorded in the vote. Some were close, Ipsos Mori, I'm pleased to say, and Salvation, both using telephone surveys, recorded 46% in their final polls, but those were taken right at the last minute. But most were shown 48, 49% including one of ours that was published on the 17th of September, just before the referendum. And I think this is important, both that everybody was, was polling wrongly and polling high, I think is an important point, which I, again, I'm gonna come back to. I suppose it's worth thinking about what the point of, of public opinion polling is. And I see it having three important functions. It tells us what people are thinking now. It's a snapshot of it's supposed to be a snapshot of what the public is thinking about an issue on the day that the poll was taken. Over time, it tells us whether there's movement uh, and in which direction public opinion seems to be moving. And it serves as an indicator of what is likely to happen in the future. We should be able to see the trajectory of public opinion uh, and how it's likely to move in the future. However, that only works if the polls are telling a consistent story. 
And I think one of the frustrating, but actually quite fascinating features of the polling around the referendum was the extent to which the polls told a very confusing story. It's fair to say that at first glance, the polls were an absolute mess. If you look at the, 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 the yes support, all, all of those support, it doesn't actually matter, I fact don't know uh, is, is doing the same thing. It's fluctuating wildly. Adjacent polls, often only a couple of days apart, can vary by up to 10 percentage points. Now personally, I don't believe that public opinion works like that. I don't believe that the public's opinions actually oscillate like that, swinging wildly from one position to another in a matter of days. Public opinion as a whole probably moves much more slowly, gently, trends build and die over longer periods of time. This suggests to me that there is something very wrong uh, in, in the, the opinion polling that was going on. And we can see uh, some of the problem if you look at the, uh, at the variation in the polls. This was, I don't know if any of you know of Mike Smithson, he runs a website called Political Betting. It's actually a very interesting website because what he's interested in doing is basically making money uh, off of political bets. And so he's keenly interested in what's happening, both in the methodology and in the results. And he published this chart in June 2014, showing the variation in no, the, the difference in no leads between the different companies. And what we see at one end is panel base uh, showing a lead for no of 8%, and at the other end, Epsos Mori is showing a 24% lead for no. And when we see something like that, you can't help but worry about who's getting it wrong. Somebody is. Those can't all be correct. And there's far too much variation to be accounted for by just kind of sampling error or variations in when the polls are being taken. This is the average over uh, six months worth of polls. So this, it, it suggests that there's something very wrong. And the frustration is understandable if you're looking for a clear indication of the public mood, whether that's for campaigning, whether it's to be reassured about your side's position, or whether it's to decide where to place your bets. And it's also a problem for the research companies. I'd say, although we make absolutely no money from political polling, it is a key feature of our reputation. People think about opinion, opinion poll companies and research companies on the basis of the extent to which they get it right. It's one of the few occasions in life when our surveys are tested against reality and people can see to what extent we were accurately uh, predicting what was going to happen. So it really matters for us. And you can kind of see what the problem is going to be in the lead up to one of the most important events in, in Scotland that we'll probably see in our lifetimes. We're worried about who's getting it wrong and who's getting it right. You can, I'll give you another example. This is, this is the polling uh, for each of the kind of six main companies involved in the referendum between September 2013 and September 2014. I mean, the, the exact numbers involved don't really match. Some things you can see uh, from it quite obviously. You can see a clear narrowing in the differences between the companies uh, over the 12 months. The gap of 10 points between Epsos Mori and Panel Base in September 2013 becomes a gap of one point in September 2014. So the gap narrows over time. And even in that jumble of data, you can see a clear trend uh, of increasing support for yes. But it, but it depends who you look at. If you look at the, the numbers for panel base alone, the green line, they go from 44% to 47% over that year. So a very slow, gradual increase. Ipsos Mori went from 34% to 46% over the same period. I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to simplify this. So if, we, if I take the group of companies that tend on the whole to have a high level of support, we see, I'll, I'll call them high consensus, you can see the kind of trend in the numbers that they were, that they were polling. And we can see a low consensus. Um, the companies who tended to be polling low uh, and how their numbers moved over the year as well. Now, what we, what we see there is, I think, two different stories about how yes support had varied over the year. I and mean, what distinguishes them is that the high consensus companies, so panel based ICM and Salvation, that have concluded, that have included as the high consensus, all use online panels of respondents. So these are the people who have signed up to take part in surveys. And so there's a fixed pool that the companies are drawing from for the work. 
Although that's not completely true. I mean, you guys, who are putting the vote consensus, also use our an online panel. But it's not Mori, we do our polling by telephone, and TNS, PMRB use face-to-face -face surveys. So there's, there's differences of method, but there's clearly two different stories. The slow, steady increase at the high consensus, and the, the kind of peak, a plateau, and then a jump uh, amongst the low consensus companies. I mean, I have to say, even two stories is not that good. This should not happen. Polls that are taken at roughly the same time intended to be representative of the same population measuring on the same issue should get roughly the same answer. There shouldn't be even two stories. There should be one story um, that, that each tells more or less consistently. So the question I suppose we, we were asking, and uh, everybody was asking up in the run up to the polls was were the polls getting it wrong? And if they were, who was getting it wrong? And as the picture suggests, you know, the answer is a kind of yes and no. We knew that there were significant, significant differences between the pollsters, and we were acutely aware that Ipsos Mori's measures tended to be low, if not the lowest, levels of yes support. We knew that we were doing nothing unusual in terms of sampling and field work, and so there needed to be some other explanation. The first clue came to us in January 2014. Uh, Alan Rennick, a reader in politics at Reading University, published a paper suggesting a tendency across all referendums for there to be a swing back to the status quo between the final polls and the actual result. So his data here, which you can see along the bottom, the white lines showing the difference between the final polls and the actual result in referendums stretching over 20 years and 34, no, yeah, 34 votes over 20 years there's a clear tendency for there to be a swing back in the last stages. And on average across all of those, 11 percentage points is lost between the final polls and the actual result. His suggestion was that perhaps we knew the result already. One of the main data, uh, if you can pick it out, it's actually, oh, I've got a point at this, um, Scotland, 1997, there. A five point swing back, uh, then to, to the establishment of the Scottish Parliament. On the surface, that's what the data suggests. Between the final polls and the actual result, there'll be a swing back. But I didn't find that particularly plausible, I have to say. The idea that people have consistently shown support for a level of change in a referendum across all loads of countries and loads of issues, and then at the last minute, they get cold feet. I don't know, it just didn't seem right. But it did suggest that there was something systematic happens with public opinion and referendums. And suggested to us that there might be a tendency for, for polling to overstate support for change, regardless of the issue and regardless of where they do it, that there, 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 there might be uh, a problem with that. The second indication came to us in June 2014 and the publication of the 2013 Scottish Social Attitude Survey. The Scottish Social Attitude Survey gives us a reliable benchmark of public attitudes in Scotland, uh, and we used that to compare the polls. Of course, the Social Attitude Survey itself isn't perfect, and there are slight differences in the questions, but that impact should be the same for everyone. So if there's a variation between the polls and the Scottish Social Attitude Survey, the problem lies in the polls. And what that comparison started to show us was some, oops, some real outliers for yes, um, PMRB uh, being both very high on don't knows and low on yes, and I have to say we were hugely reassured to find ourselves as close as we could, as you could probably conceivably get to the social attitude survey results. Slightly high for yes, and slightly high on don't know. You go slightly higher on don't knows, but much the same on yes. ICM. Again, slightly higher on yes and slightly higher on don't knows. But it gave us an idea of what the variation from a kind of central benchmark was. And we could use that to then try and see um, what was going on underneath the trends that the polls seemed to be showing. We could start to adjust the polls. So in June 2014, this is where we were with the data. Uh, this is the monthly average of all the polls that have been taken in that month, uh, just unadjusted um, and, and showing 
a clear trend towards yes, and if we projected that line forward, if we projected the trend forward, it was suggesting that the result was going to be very close, um, and that it only took a very slight support, increase in support for yes, um, to, 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 to show majority. When we took the variations from the Scottish Social Attitude Survey and started to apply that to the data, that showed something else. That actually the level of support that, that would be found was lower, and that when we projected that forward, that there needed to be a much greater increase in the level of support for yes to get a majority. And I have to say, this is the first time that this has ever been talked about outside our office, because at the time it was both hugely political to try and kind of suggest that consistently the polls were getting it wrong. And we had no idea if this was right. We didn't know if what we were doing to, to kind of adjust the data and to try and compensate for this overstatement um, was in any way accurate. The only thing that makes it worth talking about now is what we see now that we know what the actual result is. And that if we had been adjusting the data, we would have got a much clearer indication of where the support was going. And because when, when, at, at the end of the day, the final polls in September, when we adjusted them, came out at 45%. That may still just have been luck. But it seemed a bit too lucky. I'm never used to that lucky. So what does it mean? Well, I think the first thing that it means is actually that the polling referendums is hard. They don't come along very often. We don't know really what's happening in public opinion. We don't know, we don't know to what extent people uh, are telling us what they're actually going to do. But I think more importantly, the traditional relationships, the kind of tra tra traditional political relationships that people have, the traditional political allegiances get broken. And we, of course, are seeing that now. Uh, traditional political allegiances have been decisively broken in Scotland. And that is, is partly reflected in the polls. I think it tells us that the polls are a good indicator of trends and the size of gains and losses that are being made throughout the campaign. But they do have a tendency to overstate support for change, probably across the board. The Alan Rennick's analysis of a swing back isn't quite right, that there is a consistently lower level of support. And I think that is important. That tendency to overstate support for change can have important impacts. I mean, certainly if you read what Larry McDougall has to say about the YouGov poll, they used it to galvanize support uh, for, for no voters, to mobilize on the basis that it looked like they were going to lose. Had it been obvious that actually there was still a long way to go, it might have been that more no voters would have stayed at home. It might have been that, more, that fewer yes voters would have partied in George Square rather than go out canvassing. There's been a lot of criticism of the early celebrations of victory based on that poll. It does seem that some of the individual polling series that we saw during the referendum both consistently and substantially overstated yes support. And what that means is that rather than getting a consistent story from the polls, people were able to pick and choose the narrative that suited them. I think, I can't remember what Mark referred to as that kind of, where you look for the answer, you look and take the, take the poll that suits your position and believe that rather than, rather than have a clear idea of what is actually true. You, you pick the one that shows, how, shows things as you would like them to be rather than see what is actually happening. And I have to say that's, that the polls aren't enough, that we could only do this, and I think we could only do it in the future, uh, if there was some high quality and reliable benchmark data that we can use to calibrate the polls and to overcome some of the weaknesses. I think one of the things that I, that I would say is that the, the overstating of yes support seems to have been a, a long-standing feature of the polling and seems to be common across the referendums, not just in Scotland. And I think the important thing, the thing that I think has kind of lasting implications, is that the result wasn't a last minute turnaround. It wasn't the case that there was 49% for support for yes, but then people got cold feet and drew back. It seemed to be that actually there was an underlying trend that we just couldn't see. It seemed to be less about method. Um, there is, I think it's largely a reflection of engagement in the sense that. For it to be a consistent feature across all referendums, it, it suggests more that people who support change are just much more likely to engage in any form of activity that allows them to promote change. 
in the sense that, that, that there's been talk of, of people being encouraged to sign up for panels, to take part in research, in order to, to kind of push their point. They, they support change and they want to take the opportunities that are allowed uh, to, to promote that. They just seem more willing to participate. And I think in the longer term, this type of analysis doesn't support the political narrative that has developed around the vow. The idea that yes was on the brink of victory and that the vow turned it around. I mean, it's interesting that the research from the university yesterday was saying much the same, that it doesn't seem to have been as decisive uh, as it's talked about. Um, so that's what I was, was going to say that for. Um, I've got to stop. <laughs>